If it's Tuesday, search and seizure. The FBI issuing a search warrant on former President Trump's home in Mar-a-Lago, setting off a firestorm of reaction and condemnation on the right. What we know and don't know about the legal fallout in just a moment. Also, rushing to Trump's defense, Republican lawmakers demand an explanation from Attorney General Merrick Garland and the Department of Justice, with some vowing retaliation if the GOP takes back control of Congress. And also, it's Tuesday. That means voters hit the polls in four states. We'll have a live report from Battleground, Wisconsin, plus an interview with Wisconsin's former governor on tonight's key races and why they matter for November and beyond. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. We begin with the latest fallout from that bombshell, what we've all been talking about, the FBI's search of former President Trump's Florida home, what we know, what we don't know, and whether our system of justice can withstand the political aftermath of all of this. So first, what do we know? The FBI executed a search warrant at Mar-a-Lago. Of course, that happened yesterday. A senior government official telling NBC News agents spent the majority of the day there. And a source familiar with the matter says the search was tied to classified information that Mr. Trump allegedly took with him when he left the White House. Legal experts say to obtain that search warrant, Justice Department officials would have to have had to show they had probable cause that evidence of a crime would be found. So that is a very high bar there. Now, moments ago, White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre at her daily briefing told reporters President Biden was not given advance notice of the search. Was the president or anyone at the White House aware of that search warrant? Or had, has anyone at the White House or the president been briefed in the aftermath of that search warrant being executed? No. The president was not briefed, did not, was not aware of it. No. No one at the White House was given uh, a heads up. No, that did not happen. But the former president did condemn the search, alleging it was a politically motivated attack. And while specifics of yesterday's search are not yet known, Republicans have either remained silent or have defended Mr. Trump and condemned the Justice Department. In a show of apparent solidarity, a group of House Republicans are heading to Mr. Trump's home in New Jersey tonight to have dinner with him. Here's just a bit of the on-camera Republican reaction that we've seen so far. Doing this 90 days before an election reeks of politics. I know this is a dangerous precedent to set, uh, and at the end of the day, there's a tremendous burden on the Department of Justice, in my view, to explain their actions, and I hope they will. This raid wasn't about documents. This raid was about trying to disqualify a likely future election opponent, about trying to intimidate Republicans who oppose the left, and about creating a distraction from Biden's failures and the radicalism of the Democratic Party that he leads. Garland, Chris Ray, come to the House Judiciary Committee this Friday and answer our questions about this action today, which has never happened in American history. What was on the warrant? What were you really doing? What were you looking for? Why not talk to President Trump and have him give the information you're after? We've also seen folks you wouldn't necessarily describe as Trump loyalists calling on Attorney General Merrick Garland to disclose details about the search and the justifications for it. Now, when asked about it today in Kentucky, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell declined to comment on the search, saying he was focused on flood recovery efforts in his home state. But the reaction from pro-Trump online forums has been even more virulent, with some users agitating for a, quote, civil war. Some really stunning rhetoric there. I'm joined now by our team of reporters, justice and intelligence reporter Ken Delanian. Vaughn Hilliard is in West Palm Beach, Florida. Senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor is on the Hill for us today. And senior reporter Ben Collins is also tracking all of the developments. Ken, I have to start with you. You have been all over this story since it broke overnight. So what do we know about how this all unfolded? We understand that FBI agents were at Mar-a-Lago for most of the day, right? 
That's right, Kristen. And most of what we know about what happened is coming from Donald Trump himself and Trump World sources. And by their account, there was many 30 FBI agents um, who swarmed all over Mar-a-Lago. What we are told, though, is that they gave the Secret Service, and this comes from a senior official, they gave the Secret Service a heads up that they were coming, because after all, the Secret Service protects Mar-a-Lago. Uh, and that there were, there was at least one Trump lawyer who was present for part of the search. And while Trump described it as a raid, we are told that, in fact, you know, the agents were led in to the, uh, to the, to the facility, to the building, to the home, and, and essentially it, it was a very low-profile situation. They went about their work. They were not wearing FBI jackets. Nonetheless, this was a court-ordered search. They had the authority to break down the door uh, should they have needed to do that. And Donald Trump said in his statement that they broke into his safe. Now, no one from the government has confirmed that, but um, uh, people familiar with these matters say it would be perfectly normal for them to do that in a situation where they didn't have the combination. They were looking for documents. And we are told that at least part of the reason they were there had to do with, the do with documents, some of which were classified, that Trump took from the White House to Mar-a-Lago. Remember that back in January, the National Archives retrieved 15 boxes of documents, and they found what they said was some classified information in there, and they referred the matter to the Justice Department for investigation. What's a little unclear is what broke down in the negotiations between the government and, and the Trump side uh, that led to this dramatic escalation. Uh, because normally, if the government wanted some documents back from the president, they would ask for them nicely. Perhaps they would issue a subpoena. What they did in this case was an extraordinary step. The Justice Department decided that the only way they could get these documents was a, ra a, a search, a compelled search, and they had to go to the judge and get um, a, a, and convince the judge that there was probable cause to believe that evidence of a crime existed at that location. An incredibly provocative and controversial step, and one that Merrick Garland is finding himself really unable to explain because the rules and doctrine of the Justice Department say that they can't talk about a pending criminal investigation. Mm -hmm. And just very quickly, Ken, it, the approval of this, would it have had to go all the way up to Merrick Garland, to the attorney general himself? Almost certainly. There's no one I've talked to who, who understands how these matters work. That, uh, that, that doesn't believe that Merrick Garland was made, that was the final decision maker here. Chris Wray would have been involved. Uh, because don't forget, the, the FBI and, and to a lesser extent the Justice Department really took it on the chin by the inspector general of the department who did a very critical report of how they uh, did some things in the Trump-Russia investigation, particularly how they applied for FISA warrants. There was one FBI lawyer who was prosecuted, who lost his career because he misrepresented things. And so they are under enormous pressure to get this one exactly right in every respect, Kristen. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that, Ken. Vaughn, let me turn to you now. And of course, one of the notable things about this is that it was former President Trump himself who announced the fact that the FBI had conducted this search on his property, Mar-a-Lago. There's been a lot of analysis so far about why he may have done that, uh, potentially to galvanize his supporters around him as he prepares for a potential run in 2024. What are you hearing? Why do you think that the former president broke this story himself? I mean, we'll look at this. I mean, Donald Trump uses himself as a political martyr for his own political purposes. You know, we saw this there with the Mueller probe. We saw this over the course of the two impeachment trials that he went through. And now we're watching this play out here. I mean, if you, if you go and listen to any of these recent Trump rallies around the country where he has stood alongside on stage with these hand-picked uh, uh, candidates for statewide offices, he has suggested that it's not him that is under attack. It is not him that the deep state, the so-called deep state, are trying to take down, but it's the political movement that he galvanized here. And then he gets these political candidates or elected leaders, several who we have heard from over the course of the last 24 hours, from Rick Scott to Ted Cruz, uh, to Marjorie Taylor Greene, to Matt Gates, to Steve Bannon, speaking to millions of people, not only on right uh, ring, right wing propaganda sites, but also on Fox News last night, go and echo the words of the former president, an individual who is interested in being uh, the nominee for the Republican Party in 2024 here. And I think that that is where, when you are looking at this investigation, Donald Trump sees it as a must that he turn this up on side its head and use it to his advantage, to galvanize a part of the country to no longer believe whether 
whether it be in the outcome of an election, do not believe the press, do not believe in, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the CIA, the FBI, the Department of Justice, and you are seeing some key Republican figures echo that, even calling for the defunding of the Department for, uh, of Justice, Kristen. And Vaughn, do you think we've all been trying to pin down when we might hear this announcement from the former president that he is going to run again, if in fact he does make that announcement? Do you think this could speed up his timeline? What are you hearing about that? You know, there's a lot of conversations among Trump's allies over the course of the last weeks as to when exactly the former president would announce. He has opened up the door to announcing uh, within the next three months before these midterm elections here. And he has seen it as a political advantage of his to get several of these Trump-backed candidates on board, uh, essentially loyalists at the U.S. Senate level, U.S. House level, but also these governors here. And when you see this happening behind us, you I think it's noteworthy that not only has Mike Pence come out to say that he had deep concerns about the actions of the Department of Justice, but also it's forced the hand of even uh, potential his top 2024 rival, Ron DeSantis, to come out and call this a banana republic type of a situation here. Donald Trump over the last six years has successfully gotten Republicans Republican leaders to throw their saddle onto his horse, and ultimately uh, he has left these Republicans to decide whether they're going to side with him or decide with the institutions currently uh, lifted up by the Biden administration. And that's where it's interesting to see Mitch McConnell there. You heard him uh, step away and talk about the flood damage instead, because there's very few Republican leaders here that are are, are looking to stay away from uh, from this uh, situation here, Kristen. Yeah, no, you're right. And, and I think at least in the short term, we'll have to see where this all goes. This has certainly scrambled the 2024 calculus probably for a lot of candidates. Sahil, let me turn to you now. We know that the president is going to be hosting the study committee in Bedminster this evening for a dinner. It was pre-planned. Um, talk about what the purpose of this dinner was and how it just completely changed in the wake of this news that we're covering. Well, Kristen, it increasingly looks like a solidarity dinner between these members of the Republican Study Committee and uh, former President Trump. It's expected to take place tonight in Bedminster, led by Jim Banks, an Indiana Republican who is a, a firm uh, Trump ally. And it comes as there is a major coalescing happening uh, around congressional Republicans, particularly in the House, around Trump. You have Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader, trying to become House Speaker, threatening to investigate uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland uh, if Republicans are in a position to take the House of Representatives. And across the country, re many Republican candidates are latching onto this as a way to stir up their base, as a way to fundraise, including Mehmet Oz in Pennsylvania, who has nothing to do with any of this, uh, using the fact that, uh, you know, that this search happened at Mar-a-Lago to try to get Trump supporters to give his uh, campaign money. And it's a very simple narrative that these Republicans uh, are pushing out there. There's no evidence for it, but it's a very simple narrative that Trump is being targeted for political reasons by his political opponent. And the, the idea that this is a, a White House-directed conspiracy, I've got to say, Kristen, it doesn't really pass the smell test. They don't want to be talking about this right now. The White House is on, currently on a hot streak at this moment. They want to be talking about the big reconciliation bill they just passed, the fact that gas prices are slowly coming down. They want to talk about, a, uh, you know, the issue of abortion, what they want to do if they win the midterm elections. Also, Chris Ray, the FBI director, is handpicked by former President Trump, confirmed by a Republican-led uh, Senate. And Merrick Garland, indeed, DC, as you know, Kristen, he has a reputation for being extremely by the book. He's very uh, uh, timid about the idea of being perceived as political in some form or fashion to the point where Democrats and Republicans on the January 6th committee have accused him of going too easy in this investigation on the highest levels of the Trump White House. So that's all the context. That's all the political messaging. Of course, it shakes up not only 2024, but given how uh, red hot the MAGA base appears right now, the 2022 election. I think you're so right. And, you know, I've been talking to some sources who say anecdotally, some Republicans who'd broken with Trump are now coming back into the fold and saying, look, uh, we think this is government overreach. And so that's scrambling the midterms as well. You talked about Democrats in the White House and what they want to be focused on and what they want to be talking about. Do they have a strategy, Sahil, moving forward to deal with this messaging? 
I think they're still trying to figure that out. They were caught off guard just as everybody else was. You know, so far, what Democrats have said for the most part is don't make assumptions, that they're not going to comment on this. That includes Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader. That includes Speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi. They say uh, they want to learn more about this before they make any comments. They say it's premature to make assumptions about this. There's no evidence that this was politically motivated, that this was somehow directed by the White House. So uh, that's the extent of the strategy we know from uh, Democrats at this moment. Well, uh, they are certainly huddling, I think, and trying to determine how to move forward. Ben, let me turn to you on this, because you have been tracking the online reaction to the FBI search, and, and obviously some of it has been quite disturbing. What is the chatter that you are tracking, uh, particularly as it relates to the January 6th committee, and how does it compare to that? Yeah, it is uh, as bad as it's been since January 6th. And I, I will say that these are not just random people on the Internet. For example, one of the major people posting a top comment on the Donald, which is an extremist forum. The top reply to a, uh, the top post on that site last night, which was just the word lock and load, uh, featured a, a basically a recommendation for civil war. That comment was secretly, by the way, we found this out, posted by someone who is awaiting uh, their trial for what they did on January 6th. Uh, going into the Capitol building, storming the Capitol building. So uh, these are people who have acted in the past, and they will act in the future. And right now, um, they are talking a very big game. They are talking about civil war, they're talking about violence, they're talking about political assassinations. Um, this is the sort of talk that we haven't heard uh, in about two years now, uh, because those people thought they had diplomatic immunity from Donald Trump back then. And you know, they kind of did. They were allowed to say whatever they wanted to on the Internet. Now the game has changed, but they are, they don't care. They, they are just saying uh, all the civil war talk and violent rhetoric that they want. Mm. And, and who's really receiving the most backlash over this, Ben? Is there a way to determine that at this point? Is it the White House, the FBI? What, what are you seeing? It's all over the place. Uh, you know, the militias are focused on the FBI. That makes a lot of sense. The Boogaloo movement, for example, which is tied into a lot of these militias always go after what they call alphabet boys, which are like three-letter agencies, the FBI, the CAA, the DOJ. Um, they have been focused mostly on the FBI. Some other people have been focused on the Biden administration, who they think has personally ordered this overnight to take out a political enemy. Um, and some people have, you know, more uh, are focused on the minutia, focused on, uh, you know, people like Nancy Pelosi or people on the sideline, their own uh, stalking horse, basically. So. Uh, it depends on the person, and that's very good news, by the way. Uh, if it was all centralized onto one day, if it was all centralized onto one place or one person, um, the organization's a lot easier. That's what, that's what made January 6th work so well for all these militias. They knew where to go. There was a guy at the top telling everyone, everyone where to be at the right moment. Um, it is not like that right now. And uh, the thing that you can probably, I would say, best hope for is that it remains that way. Well, it, this is just a, a huge news development and really appreciate all of you helping to start us off. Ben Collins and before that, Kendallanian, Vaughn Hilliard and, of course, Sahil Kapoor. Fantastic reporting all around. We appreciate your getting us started. And coming up as the Justice Department faces scrutiny, we're going to talk to a former federal prosecutor and judge, along with the top Justice Department reporter, about where the investigations into Mr. Trump goes from here and the legal fallout next. Plus, proxy wars, swing states and the race for power. Polls close hours from now in some of the top races to watch this cycle. We have all the details ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us. Nobody's above the law, but the law needs to be above politics. I talked to the president just about an hour ago with Henry. The one thing I can tell you is that I believed he was going to run before. I'm stronger in my belief now. Welcome back. That was Lindsey Graham. The senator's remarks this afternoon highlighting the unprecedented situation facing the Justice Department right now, as it appears to be ramping up its investigations tied to a former president, who, of course, also happens to be a potential future presidential candidate, as you just heard Lindsey Graham reference there. I'm joined now by Carol Lamb, former federal prosecutor and an NBC News legal analyst, and Katie Benner, justice reporter at The New York Times and an NBC News contributor. Thanks so much to both of you. I really appreciate it. Carol, let me start 
with you. And I was talking to Ken Delanian about this a little bit, but I hope you can flesh it out, which is, can you talk about the very high bar that exists in order to execute a search warrant of this magnitude and of a former president? This is really unprecedented, right? Right. So what you're talking about here, um, Kristen, is the difference between the legal bar, which is not actually all that high, but the practical bar that exists here because of the situation dealing with a former president and one who may potentially run to be president again. It's that latter portion that's really in effect here. The legal portion is probable cause, which is the lowest criminal threshold for uh, getting a search warrant, it just you just have to show a reasonable probability that a crime is being committed and that items evidencing that crime are located in the place where you're, you're searching. But what the Justice Department has to consider here is a whole host of, of considerations, operational and otherwise. You know, one is that operational and political, really. One, one is that they're getting close to the November elections. Another is that they're trying to effect a search warrant at a place where there's another federal agency, the Secret Service, that's charged with protecting this former president and his family. And so everybody's armed. You've got the FBI that's armed. You've got Secret Service that's armed. And so a lot of coordination has to take place before you can effect a search warrant like this. And then, of course, there's the political fallout that we're seeing now uh, with, with comments by members of Congress about the ramifications of having a search like this. So there's going to be a very internal high bar that the Justice Department is going to make sure it meets before it executes a search warrant in this fashion. Well, and you take me to my next question, Carol, before I get to Katie, but, but this notion of Based on a lot of our reporting so far, we know that they were looking for uh, classified information um, potentially tied to these documents, of course, that the former president may have taken out of the White House with him, have been accused of mishandling classified information before, and that this moment seems to take it a step further. Can you help us understand what the differences might be? Sure. There's a lot that we don't know. So a lot of this is just speculation based on things that I've seen during my history at the, at the Justice Department. And it is important to say that different prosecutors, different DOJs at different times may take different approaches to investigations. But what we seem to, to have here is this is sort of a, an, an action when other means of trying to get information and documents have been frustrated. Remember, the National Archives went and retrieved 15 boxes of documents way back in February. And so there appears to have been ongoing dialogue about things that the National Archives is saying are missing, even in those 15 boxes of documents. And given that there is just nothing, nothing further coming their way, they felt they had no choice but to execute a search warrant. And these are documents. They are not they are not necessarily electronic documents, which maybe there are other ways of getting to those electronic documents. If these are physical documents, there's no other way to get to them but apparently to execute a search warrant if subpoenas and negotiation are not working. So, Katie, given the enormity of this and of this moment, and, and as Carol is laying out so clearly what must have gone into executing this search warrant, a lot of people are saying, why haven't we heard yet from the DOJ? Can you help us understand the why, and do you anticipate that we will in the near term? So I don't think that we're going to hear from the Justice Department. I do not think that the Justice Department is going to try to justify its action today. They feel that they've already justified the action by requesting from a federal judge the ability to go execute a search warrant on Donald Trump's property. They feel that they've already submitted the evidence they need in order to get a search warrant, and that that is as much as they need to say. The department, as we can see, is already being accused of acting politically, already being accused of using its powers improperly. And you can only imagine that that would increase if Justice Department officials came out and said anything untoward about former President Donald Trump, that that would be called a, a direct attack, that that would be painted as, you know, d a direct uh, attack on a former president. However, to your point, by not speaking, by following Justice Department policy, 
by not speaking about ongoing criminal matters, it does create this information vacuum that we've seen time and again that the former president is more than willing to fill. He did it during the Russia investigation when special counsel Robert Mueller refused to speak publicly about his investigation, and he's done it since. And he is more than willing to weaponize that silence on behalf of the prosecutors in order to fill it with his own version and his own narrative. You hear some people, Katie, speculating about whether this is actually about more than documents. Do you think that that's a possibility? What are your sources telling you in that regard? Sources are saying that the Justice Department is going to comply with its subpoena, which means it's going to look for the documents as, you know, as a applied to a federal judge. It's not going to go beyond the four corners of the subpoena, particularly in a case that's going to come under such scrutiny. Not only will this subpoena be scrutinized, if anything about this case should ever hit a court of law, you can certainly expect that if we have a Republican administration, if we have, a, you know, an appointee of a Republican administration, certainly if we have an appointee of a Trump administration, that every single move being made today will be publicly aired. It will be given to a congressional oversight committee, and every single decision made will become public someday. So even though the Justice Department is remaining silent today, I'm told the officials are extremely cognizant of this risk, which is why they are acting so incredibly cautiously. They are going to execute the warrant and search for the documents as listed on the warrant. They are not going to go beyond that. Carol, what are you looking for? Do you expect at any point that the affidavit would be made public? And I guess just down the line, what are you looking for to, to understand what specifically is happening a little bit more clearly? It's actually pretty rare that a search warrant affidavit becomes public. This is this is what Donald Trump's staff received. And by the way, I think it was quite intentional that they executed the search warrant when they knew that Donald Trump was not going to be at, at the residence. So, so they would leave behind an inventory of what was actually taken, and then they would also have to give a copy of the face of the search warrant that says what the uh, in, what the crimes under investigation are and the uh, the items that it would intend to seize, but it would not they would not leave the actual search warrant be, behind. Not I mean the actual affidavit, and uh, that is an affidavit that is sworn to under oath by an agent, and it explains to the magistrate judge or the federal judge what the cause is, what the probable cause is for executing the search warrant. So unless the case goes to trial or goes through motions uh, to suppress evidence and there's some infirmity that the uh, defense attorney is claiming occurred in the actual affidavit, it may never actually become public. So what what we would see, and again, there's, there's that mantra that the Department of Justice speaks through its actions. Uh, you might you might see some hint of what's going on through uh, grand jury that grand jury proceedings that take place. But again, while the government cannot talk about it, witnesses and uh, targets or subjects can talk about what their experiences are with the Justice Department. So we're going to have to see how the information comes out. And the discretion that was exercised in executing this search warrant shows that the department is uh, not stepping outside the bounds on, on this one, as I think is appropriate. All right. Well, thank you so much for helping us to understand what is a complicated and developing story uh, even more clearly. Carol Lamb and Katie Benner really, really appreciate it. We are going to have, of course, much more on the ongoing fallout over the FBI search of Mr. Trump's Florida residence still to come. And up next, it's decision day in Wisconsin. Voters making their choice in a hyper competitive Republican primary for governor with the power of Mr. Trump's endorsement once again on the line. You're watching Meet the Press now. We're back after a quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back. If it's Tuesday, voters are voting somewhere. Of course, we always say that, right? And today, that somewhere is Vermont, Connecticut, Minnesota, and also Wisconsin. Now, that is where the most closely watched race of the day is taking place right now. Republicans in Wisconsin see a chance to oust incumbent governor Tony Evers in November and pick up a governor's mansion. Well, we'll have to see what happens. The stakes are very high. Former Governor Scott Walker and former Vice President Mike Pence 
are backing Rebecca Cleishfield. And former President Trump has endorsed her opponent. We've seen this play out in a number of races, Tim Michaels. Meanwhile, Democrats hoping to flip a Senate seat in November have coalesced behind Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes to take on Senator Ron Johnson. You've probably heard a lot about this race. It is heating up as well. Joining us now, the person who's been tracking all of this, NBC's Shaq Brewster. Shaq, good to see you, my friend. Thanks for joining us. So what's the feeling on the ground right now with the Senate race and the gubernatorial races? Yeah, it's another state and another feeling of a proxy battle where you have candidates endorsed by two different wings of the Republican Party up comparing and competing against one another. You mentioned Tim Michaels, backed by former President Donald Trump. He's a candidate who wasn't even listed in some of the early polling, but after that endorsement from the former president and after a lot of personal money put into the race to get himself on the television airwaves, you've seen him boosted to the top of the field. He's now challenging the lieutenant governor, former lieutenant. Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish, who is backed by Vice President Pence and Scott Walker. Both of those two men have been aggressive out on the trail for her. Uh, Scott Walker cutting both radio ads and television ads for her. So you have Republican voters telling me that they are stressed out, frankly. Some of them saying they haven't made a decision <laughs> and will not make a decision until they go ahead and vote at the polling booth behind me. They feel the pressure. They know we're watching and they know that this is going to be close. That's something that you heard from both candidates earlier earlier today, Kristen. Yeah, that is a good way to put it, Shaq. That's for sure. So, of course, all of this, the voters going to the polls, comes against the backdrop of that unprecedented, extraordinary search at Mar-a-Lago. We've spent most of the show talking about it. What are voters saying to you? Is that impacting yeah. the way they're voting today? You know, I had a lot of conversations with voters as they were coming out of the voting booth, and none of them said that this was something that impacted their vote. You did hear the candidates this morning, however, try to use this to drive up turnout in this primary. Listen to what they said. I found it shocking, unprecedented. You know, I'm following it the same as you all this morning, and I have not seen any new developments, but I remain shocked by what I saw and what I'm hearing. It's scary to wake up this morning and see that the, the, the government has raided the house of the former president. If they can do it to the former president, they can do it to anybody, and that is very concerning. That's why people are concerned about the direction that America is going. It's, uh, it's something that everyone should be concerned about. You hear Michaels, who's backed by Trump, was more fired up about it. But again, this hasn't translated to my conversations with voters. Kristen? Great reporting, great interviews. As always, Shaq Brewster, thank you. And coming up next, I am going to talk to Wisconsin's former governor, Republican Governor Scott Walker, after the break on the future of his party and why he isn't standing with the former president's endorsement in Wisconsin. A lot to discuss today. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we mentioned for the second time in as many weeks, voters are heading to the polls in a Republican gubernatorial primary that has turned into a proxy war between the establishment and Trump wings of the party. We are joined now by former Wisconsin Republican Governor Scott Walker, who is backing former Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Cleefish in the Republican primary, of course. And she is taking on someone who's backed by former President Trump. Governor, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Kristen, good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. We are going to get to the races in just a moment. But first, of course, I do have to get your reaction to this extraordinary breaking news, the FBI executing a search warrant of former Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort. What do you make of it? Well, it's outrageous. This idea that the FBI doesn't look into Hillary Clinton, they don't look into Hunter Biden, and yet they're going into the home of a president. Uh, this is unprecedented weaponizing. Well, the FBI, uh, the FBI did FBI look into Hillary Clinton. The, of Justice, the FBI did look outrageous. into Hillary Clinton, Governor. What's that? But Governor, the FBI did. The FBI did look into Hillary Clinton. Well, they didn't do the kind of things you're seeing here. Even when you look at our emails and everything else involved, but particularly Hunter Biden, or even now. Uh, some of the biggest critics of that being exposed right before the 2020 election are now highlighting that we should be doing more to look into Hunter Biden. And yet they've just weaponized this in a way that Rebecca Clayfish and I actually 
personally know about. They tried to do a John Doe investigation twice here in Wisconsin, very similar uh, to what they're trying to do here, and it was ultimately shut down. But that was being politicizing uh, local prosecutors like they're doing at the federal level. Well, and, and to be fair, that investigation has not finished. We don't know where it's going to go. And so we still need to let that play out, I think, before there's a judgment about it. I guess let me play you some sound from one of your colleagues, uh, Senator, your Republican colleague, Senator Marco Rubio. And I want to get your reaction on the other side. And it, it kind of fits into the broader argument that you're making. So let's play the sound. I'll get your reaction. The truth is this raid wasn't about documents. This raid was about trying to disqualify a likely future election opponent, about trying to intimidate Republicans who opposed the left, and about creating a distraction from Biden's failures and the radicalism of the Democratic Party that he leads. It was no coincidence they did this just two days before the new inflation numbers come out this week, because they want the media talking about this raid. Is there a, a, a danger in, in making these accusations, trying to politicize the actions of the DOJ before having all of the information? DOJ is an independent agency. Well, there certainly hasn't been a lot of transparency. And for years, we said, oh, agencies like the FBI, Department of Justice, and the IRS couldn't do things like this. And wow, during the Obama administration, we actually found, yes, they were targeting conservative organizations. And there was documented evidence. But the of that FBI that is con but, but, Governor, Governor, the FBI is controlled by Chris Wray, who was appointed by former President Trump. And Are it's you all saying part of he's not leading an independent agency? It's all part of a deep state that we've seen the kind of sentiment that we've seen. It's why, my goodness, why people objected to putting more IRS agents out there. These folks that are part of a deep state in Washington, very much like we dealt with. Chris Ray, Chris Ray, who was appointed by Trump, Governor, is was part of the deep with, state. He was appointed. I'm talking about people within the organization, just like I dealt with when we had two different John Doe investigations that were ultimately thrown out by a federal judge. Uh, they went through that whole process, did the sort of cut raids to supporters of ours, did the sort of things that we're seeing played out, and ultimately was thrown out, even to the point of even after a federal judge ordered all the documents returned, accidentally uh, leaked to the press on a Friday afternoon, uh, 150,000 some emails of mine, none of which were very interesting, but nonetheless— <laughs> I think when people see this over and over again, they say, this is not just a coincidence. This is part of a pattern of people who are deeply entrenched Governor, in whether it's the federal, state, or local government. Let, but let, let's stick to the, the, the search of Mar-a-Lago and this breaking news. I mean, are you not undercutting the public's faith in the Department of Justice, an independent agency, by suggesting that it's a part of the DOJ without any evidence? You haven't brought forth any evidence to actually suggest prove that this not, was politically this motivated case, or that any of these people are involved in, in a so-called deep state. We, we, we suggest that there should be absolute transparency about this process. But when you have a pattern and you see it over and over again in the past, it certainly raises a red flag when something like this happens right now. We've seen it time and time and time and time again. And at some point, the American people start to say, hey, there's a pattern here. And it's disgusting because justice, Department of Justice, well, the FBI, and, and, even the and Internal guess, Revenue Agency should be above this all. Equal justice under but governor, the law. Governor, the, is there not is there not a danger in, in making those accusations without anything to back them up? Our Ben Collins, Ryan Riley have been reporting that some of the former president's supporters have been going online, even calling for a so-called civil war. I, I mean, do you oh, worry that you're not, feeding into should, some of that rhetoric and fire? Well, one, we shouldn't be talking about a, a civil war in terms of violence, but we shouldn't at the same time somehow think that people can't speak out on this. When we heard about Russian collusion, and then you see this all the way going back to the Clinton campaign, uh, when you see evidence coming out over and over again over the last four or five years, again, I know I feel strongly about this because not only did Donald Trump deal with it, I dealt the same sort of thing here in Wisconsin. It's part of the reason why backing Rebecca Clayfish for governor, because she's been tested having to go through this nonsense as well. We don't back down, nor do we expect the president in the United States, but, Donald Trump, to do that either. But, Governor, ju just to be clear, you acknowledge no. that we don't, you don't have all of the information yet, and you have yet to put forth any information or, or evidence that this is politically motivated. You're just making that accusation, frankly, without any I'm evidence to back it up. And this is 
it's a long and established pattern of the past few years of this sort of thing happening. It happened under the Obama administration. We saw it in the IRS and was very much documented and proven and brought before Congress. We've seen it now since then well, in the Department of Justice. And we're seeing a DOJ that actually was more comfortable aligning with a group that called concerned parents domestic terrorists than actually doing things to protecting seated members of the of the U.S. Supreme Court when people were violating federal code in front of their house. Just, but, Governor, Governor, just staying on the Mar-a-Lago issue, just to be clear, the, the FBI is directed by Christopher Wray, who was appointed by former President Trump. So it does seem to undercut your argument that there's some broader, deeper, malicious thing No, because the FBI isn't here. made up entirely of political right. appointees. It's made up of people who overwhelmingly are career uh, bureaucrats, uh, people that overwhelmingly right. are part of the—, the, the uh, the, the let, swamp that people talked about time and time again. Let me let me ask you about something you told my colleague Shaquille Brewster that former President Trump deserves to still have an influence in the GOP after his time in office. Given everything that has been revealed about his actions before, on, and after January sixth, can you still make that argument? Has your mind changed at all? My point when I said to him then, as I would say to you now, is because of the things that were accomplished during his four years as president of the United States, because of the unbelievably positive policies that led us to one of the healthy econ healthiest economies in the history of our nation, because of the things he did to get the federal government out of our, out of our backs and out of our lives, I look at what he did, the judges, the justices that were nominated to the federal bench, and a whole assortment of other things, and say, yeah, he still has a right, just as others do. Uh, to speak out and, and, and be a and part that of all leading the party January the 6th, Governor, Governor that, that? All, that all outweighs January 6th and what we've learned that he did not do during the hours that the attack was ongoing? I, I, would, I would love to have you come with me to Wisconsin because I don't hear people talk about January 6th. They talked about it a year and a half ago. But, I, but I'm asking you about January 6th, Governor. Did, Can, but I'm asking you about January 6th. But the vast majority of people are infinitely more concerned about why their gas prices have gone up under Joe Biden, why their food costs have gone up. They want people to respond to those things. It's people in Washington but, and the bubble that keep talking about January 6th. But are you concerned about what happened on January 6th and the former president's role in it? I am concerned that people in Washington that live in the bubble keep talking about things that everyday citizens have long since a year and a half ago already gone past. It's not that they didn't like that they agreed with everything that happened that day, but they expected it to be taken care of back then. Dredging this off again, I think most Americans, particularly here in Wisconsin, think is just a huge distraction from the issues that really matter to them. And they're going to vote for people today and in November who actually address those issues. And yet, Governor, you are backing Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Cleefish, as we've been talking about, who, of course, is running against someone who former President Trump is backing. He's backing businessman Tim Michaels. Why did you break with the former president on this, and why do you think she's the better pick? Well, I've supported her since day one, so I was out front in this because I saw firsthand someone who had never held office before. She and Ron Johnson ran for the very first time in 2010. She won a primary where she took on a Capitol Insider and then joined me on the ticket. Not only did we win, but we took on the big, bold, positive, conservative forms that turned our state around, even in the midst of all the protests and riots. She was herself dealing with cancer, and yet she didn't back down. She's ready on day one. She's going to be an excellent governor. And by all the polls show, she's the best position to get rid of Tony Evers who's been an absolute disappointment. He shut down our economy. He shut down our schools. He did little or nothing about violence in our streets, and she's the one that's going to turn it around. All right. Well, of course, uh, he and his team would probably disagree with you on all of that, and we will have to see what happens in this primary race. Governor Scott Walker, really appreciate your joining us. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Kristen. Good to be with you. You too. Still to come, President Biden and his party hope to build on recent midterm momentum as the nation faces the fallout of an unprecedented FBI search of former President Trump's home. My panel digs into all of it next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Let's get right to the panel. Joining me now is Adrian Elrod, who is a Democratic strategist, and Stephen Hayes, editor and CEO of The Dispatch and an NBC News contributor. And Stephen, I want to just start with you. Um, did you hear my interview with former Governor Scott Walker, and what is your reaction to it? I did. I mean, 
It's interesting. I think you were right to press him on his claim that this is just a politicized investigation, that we know it's politicized and that this bodes ill for the republic. Uh, we know no such thing. This is way too early to be making such claims. And I do think it's irresponsible and contributes to this kind of environment that we're talking about. Having said that, I think on substance, he made some good points. The FBI has created its own problems in this regard. If you look at the inspector general report of Crossfire Hurricane and some of the things that happened during the early parts of the Trump administration, there were some serious uh, misdeeds done by the FBI. Some of them, I think, accidental and sloppy. Some of them pretty clearly intentional. So there's a reason that people are skeptical of the FBI. And then the final point on, on his comparison of the FBI uh, treatment of Donald Trump and the local prosecutor's treatment of Scott Walker, I think he's right. I mean, I think the local prosecutor in the John Doe probe here in Wisconsin was way, way out over his skis and really deserves all the criticism that he got. Well, Adrian, you know, it, it's interesting because part of what we learned from that interview with the former governor of Wisconsin is a very clear kind of laying out what we are likely going to hear and what we've already heard from a number of Republicans who are rallying around former President Trump, right? I mean, what do you make of that? Well, yeah, Kristen, of course, first of all, the hypocrisy is in full force right now. Um, you know, all my Hillary Clinton colleagues and I could talk about last night was, oh, but her emails and and how, you know, Republicans cried wolf and, and couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't, couldn't believe that, um, you know, couldn't couldn't stop talking about the email scandal, which wasn't even really a scandal. It was a manufactured scandal by the Republicans. And of course, now Donald Trump has committed something far worse and far more extreme. And Republicans are saying that the FBI is overstepping, that this gives Donald Trump all the ammunition he needs to run for reelection or to rather run for president again. Um, so we're seeing the playbook come out in full force. And I didn't have a chance to hear your entire interview with Scott Walker, but I did hear parts of it where he's essentially echoing what the Republicans are saying. And this is also what I find rich, Kristen. If Republicans take back the House um, in the midterm election, we know for a fact that Jim Jordan, some of these Republicans who will have, it over, who will have control of the Judiciary Committee in the House, the House Oversight Committee, will overreach. They will try to investigate every single administration official they can. They are going to try to investigate President Biden's family. Talk about overreach. And here's the FBI actually doing its job, trying to understand why Donald Trump took classified documents out of the White House. Um, and, and they're saying that this is um, overreach by the FBI. So I think we know their playbook. It's coming out in full force. But I think, truthfully, they are very worried about what is happening to, you know, the guy who's, who's led their party and still continues to be the dominant force in the Republican Party. Well, Kevin McCarthy making it very clear that if they do win back the majority, if he is, in fact, the speaker, that he plans to uh, call Attorney General Merrick Garland to the Hill to ask him about all of this. But, Stephen, to Adrian's point, I've had a number of conversations in the wake of this raid, and one thing is clear, which is that it seems like Republicans, some of them who've broken with Trump, are coming back into the fold with yeah. him, are starting to support him all over again. I mean, to what extent does this just galvanize Republicans, some of the more moderate Republicans, some of the Republicans who liked him but broke with him because they got fed up with his behavior? Do a number of them start coming back now into Trump world? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very valid question. And I would say the early returns suggest that, yes, suggest that that is going to have that effect with with what how Republicans will treat this. I mean, the, the, the sound you played from Marco Rubio making just sort of unqualified accusations that this is the FBI being politicized and overstepping its bounds and what have you, that's really irresponsible rhetoric. Now, I don't agree with Adrian. I don't think we know that this is the FBI acting in good faith and only, you know, following the law and following up uh, what we have heard from previous reports, I think we don't know that either. I think we don't know that what Republicans are claiming. I don't think we can say this is the FBI acting in good faith, performing professionally as we always have seen, because as I said, there are incidents, there are times that we can point to in the not too distant past where the FBI hasn't done that. But I think some of the rhetoric that we're getting from from Republicans is, is grossly irresponsible. I think that what Kevin McCarthy said, these warnings about immediate investigations and you should save your papers, uh, I think that's way, way over the top. And in this political environment, it's the last thing we need. Adrian, one of the last times you and I spoke, we talked about the fact that Democrats were 
finally starting to have a message, a record they could run on. We saw the vote in Kansas, and so a lot of Democratic strategists had started to turn their focus even more on abortion and how that language could fit into their arguments, both in the midterms and then, of course, in the next presidential election. You know better than anyone, former President Trump sucks up a lot of oxygen. Is this now becoming a roadblock for Democrats when they had just started to find their footing? No, I don't think so, Kristen. I mean, I, I don't know how long this is going to be a story, but I think it's important that every single Democrat who voted for the Inflation Reduction Act, which, of course, is every single Democrat in the Senate, um, we're going to have a big vote next week in the House. Now they got to go back to their districts and sell the bill, sell the fact that while Republicans want to uh, do everything they can to, to not address inflation, that Democrats are doing everything they can to lower costs for families, lowering prescription drug costs, lowering health care costs. They just did that by, by passing this bill. So we've got to create that echo chamber. We've got to keep this in the news. And, you know, the local press is very important to Kristen. And these guys can drive their own local headlines, and that's going to be an important factor as well. All right. Well, fantastic conversation and way to end this show. Stephen and Adrian, thank you both for your great insights. Really appreciate it. And thank you for being with us this hour. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.